Uh, another study we had uh, was looking at the role of anti-angiogenesis in combination with, with a first-generation uh, TKI and EGFR mutant lung cancer, the RELAY study. Um, Bob, you want to talk a little, walk us through that a little bit and tell us what that showed? Yeah, so this was another randomized phase three uh, trial of erlotinib plus erlotinib and ramasuramab in EGFR mutation positive uh, patients. And this was um, uh, very exciting results in terms of uh, dramatically improved progression-free survival going from 11 months to 19 months. Um, and on the surface, that looks fantastic because now we're talking about numbers that are similar to osimertinib, right? 19 months, 19 months. I think there are a couple of uh, cautions here. So first, uh, um, patients with brain metastasis were excluded. Um, and so that's roughly a third of our patients who would not uh, be applicable for this therapy. Um, and, and so we know that osimertinib has good CNS penetration and, and that those patients um, uh, also tend to do worse. So the numbers might look worse in this study had we um, uh, um, uh, put them in the study. Um, so I think that's one caution I can tell. Of course, we're adding IV therapy uh, to a TKI. So they have to be infused every two weeks, and, and that's a caution. Um, what I think is most interesting about this study is that it's telling us something about anti-angiogenic therapies, right? So like the prior chemotherapy study, we have two prior fa uh, phase two and a phase three study out of Japan demonstrating similar results adding bevacizumab to a first generation TKI. So I really think that there's something to this combination um, in terms of synergy and, and what we really need to wait for is an osimertinib plus anti-angiogenic trial, so. So you, you, we'll talk about the <laughs> OC with uh, Bev, uh, uh, poster, um, you know, how do we interpret this data? I, th I think Lily's going to move forward with approval of this. Is this, does this have traction, or is this a, a big nothing burger? I mean, I think that, <laughs> I think that the issue is that um, in the United States we have access to osimertinib, which showed clear improvement over first generation TKIs. So. If, I'm, if I have my choice, I would give osimertinib. Um, if I don't have access to osimertinib, if somebody blindfolds me and I can't find the pharmacy <laughs> where, I, where it is, like I don't know why, why that would happen, but if I were uh, or, unable to give, right. or I was in a country where right. I didn't, right, another option. More likely. Yeah, right. It's more likely. Slightly. 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 Do you get Slightly. blindfolded a lot? Very <laughs> frequently. It's a yeah, whole problem we have to deal with. <laughs> anyway, um, if I did not have access to osimertinib, then your two options to add to a first generation TKI based upon the data that we saw today and the data we've seen in the past would be adding chemotherapy or adding VEGF. And to me, you've got one in chemo that is associated with an overall and progression-free survival advantage that is remarkable. And then you have another where you have a PFS advantage, which is impressive, but you have no OS advantage. And we saw in the BEV studies with first-generation TKIs that despite a rather impressive, even more impressive PFS improvement, the OS did fail to improve. And we've seen this over and over with VEGF inhibition. So to me, if I was gonna add something to a TKI, I would add chemo way before I would add VEGF inhibition. Well, just on that point though, I mean, the chemo did double the rate of grade three toxicities yeah. from something like 25% to 50%. And then bear in mind that that overall survival may be a factor of the setting in which the country, the, 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 the study was conducted in the country where access to subsequent treatments well, may be an issue. Well, but that's true. And in, I believe that in the study presented today, only 11% of patients got osimertinib. Um, but, so that's a ba big in, difference. In the relay study? In, in, no, in the, uh, in the study from Tata Memorial, from the okay. Dr. Naronha. Um, but the, in the Japanese study, in NEG's, NEJ009, I believe they did have access to osimertinib in that study. And so we still saw a benefit there. So I'm not, uh, uh, if I were adding something to a first generation TKI, I would add chemo. I personally don't see a major drive to add that, Jeff. I mean, the, the temptation is that um, with erlotinib plus uh, bevacizumab, you still have, or erlotinib plus ramacirumab, excuse me, you still have uh, osimertinib as a backup therapy, right? And they actually looked at the T790M rate. It was very similar in the yeah, two sure. arms. Sure. Um, however, again, I think you know we don't have those brain metastasis patients, and I think that's the biggest limitation of the of the study. So, should you want to comment briefly on kind of moving the bar forward and adding uh, bevacizumab to 
Next Generation TKI with Osa Merton. We had a poster from Helena Yu, uh, mostly looking at safety from a phase one uh, experience, but having some efficacy results as well. Yeah, you know, I think we all agree. I think actually with both the, the VEGF story and with the chemotherapy story, you know, it's hard to know what to do with these data in the era of osimertinib, and I think all of these data really will be worth repeating with, with uh, osimertinib. Um, so Dr. Yu and Dr. Chris did present um, some data from an ongoing single arm phase two study that they have um, combining osimertinib with bevacizumab at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, relatively small numbers still, about 49 patients have been treated. Um, but overall, I mean, I think pr promising results, you know, response rate is about 69%, but 70% of the patients were progression free at a year, you know, they don't have longer term follow up yet. And importantly, the toxicity seemed to be pretty similar to what we expected, you know, some rate of um, diarrhea, thrombocytopenia, things we're used to seeing with, um, with osimertinib, some, you know, VEGF uh, toxicities like hypertension, but overall manageable. And I think this speaks to the fact that this is feasible, perhaps even more feasible than doing it with erlotinib or gefitinib. Um, and importantly, uh, there will be an, uh, an ECOG study, a cooperative group study, uh, looking at this exact question, randomizing patients to osimertinib versus osimertinib and bevacizumab. So. How frequently is the BEV given? Whereas the, the ramacirumab was every two weeks, yes. which is a really short leash. Yes. You know? right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and an important question perhaps for the future, whether we could de-escalate that, right, to free up patients from our infusion centers. Or, and is it the continuous, or is there, you know, I think yeah. with some of the chemotherapy studies, the question is, do you need to give maintenance chemo or just the upfront? I think there's a lot of questions yeah. that could be teased out, but my sense is that, you know, if the benefit is big enough, patients will be willing to come in every two or three weeks, or whatever it may be, if it really is helping them to live longer. Yeah.